Good day. Welcome again to another episode of What's Up Prof. I'm Martin Smith. I'm Walter. Hello, Walter. Hi. Today we're going to talk about a little bit what is the culmination of the end of the age. Correct, because people are asking, uh, they want to know the sequence, and the world out there has so many views on the coming of Christ, so just for clarification, because we are dealing with end time issues, let's just give the sequence how it will take place right through to the end, mm. and uh, this serves basically as, as a Bible expose for those who need a little bit more info on this issue. And like you've said in the previous ones, this is maybe another tool that you can put in your toolbox when you want to evangelize. Correct. So let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you again for bringing us together. Lord, we are looking forward to the day when Jesus comes through the clouds, come and fetch us. Let us now enlighten the viewers and also ourselves on these subjects. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, Martin, everybody's waiting for history's coming climax. I certainly yes. am looking forward to it. This is Wesley's famous declaration. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way for this very end he came from heaven. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God. Then he says, I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be homo unios libri, man of one book. So basically what he is saying, and this is what the Reformation said, if you have the Bible, then precept upon precept, line upon line, you shouldn't be able to, to be rattled because mm. God has put it in the book and we need to see what it says. Acts 1 verse 11, O ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That is the death knell of spiritualism. True. Isn't it? Definitely, yeah. Because they make it a spiritual event, mm. spiritualize away the literal coming of Christ. And that's why they, as Blavatsky said, love the Kabbalistic versions of the Bible, the new ones, mm. which talk of an end of the age and not the end of the world. Mm. And the coming of Christ to them is not a literal appearing in the clouds. But here we have a very clear statement that it is a literal event, right? So we have to ask ourselves a few questions. Why will he come again? How will he come again? So that we don't get confused. Yes, very important. Because Jesus warned us there will be false Christs and Satan will impersonate him. Correct. So why will he come again? Titus 2 verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now the grammar in the original Greek here makes it quite obvious that the great God and the Savior, Jesus Christ, are one and the same. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is another key verse that tells us about Jesus. Yeah. And uh, it's the blessed hope. That's what everybody is waiting for. I, I am stunned that people don't want it to happen. Yeah, they're clinging to whatever earthly treasure they treasure, have. Treasure, yeah. Yeah, and they obviously are not too interested in the blessed hope, right? John 14 is my miniature Bible of the end time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These few verses, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Martin, is that literal? Yes. 
You believe it? I do. And it's What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> I love that those verses. That's I'm so glad this is the King James Version, of course. In my father's house are many mansions. Mm -hmm. If you read the modern translations, there are many houses. And if you read the modern, modern ones, there's plenty of room. Rooms. You don't get anything. You're a <laughs> ghost on cloud nine. So again, they want to spiritualize everything mm. away. And according to this verse, Martin, when do you go to heaven? When he comes to receive you. When he comes back. To but earth. what does the world believe? You're going to be raptured up. And the other ones believe that when you die, you directly go to him. So they're all there already. Mm. So what's the point in coming to fetch them if they're all there already? You know, this it's is, it's so plain and logical when you let the Bible interpret itself. Yeah, like I mentioned in my testimony, this is the exact ver verse, the last one that just, I mean, when you read that and discover it through the help of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> It has to wipe out all those confusion. That Correct. Had. Read your Bible as it stands. How will it come again? Well, it will be universally visible. Behold, he comes with the clouds and every eye shall see him. Revelation 1 verse 7. So every eye will see him, Martin. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, for as the lightning comes out of the east and shineth even to the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So it will be a spectacular event, and every eye will see it. Exactly. That's every eye that's alive mm. will see it. It's not some secret thing that happens somewhere. Now what does it mean when it says it comes with the clouds? Well, Hebrew parallelism must answer this for us. Psalms 104 verse 3, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. So we still don't know what it is, but we have a synonym which they use, clouds, chariot. Hmm. We go on. Matthew 24, And they shall see the Son of Man coming with in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now in your prayer, Martin, you said he's coming through the clouds, but he's coming in the clouds. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then we want to know what these chariots are. Psalm 68 verse 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. So now we have a clear picture. Mm -hmm. The Bible, again, interprets it itself. So he comes with his thousands and thousands and millions and millions of angels. Mm -hmm. That'll be spectacular. If one angel walking towards the grave caused the earthquake, right? Yeah. <laughs> if one angel made them fall like dead men, if one angel rolled back that stone with his finger, <laughs> what's it going to be like yeah. when billions of angels Man. come? One angel took out 180,000 Sir Assyrian soldiers in one single so, night, right? No, I think it. It's unfathomable. Yes. And the, <laughs> they tried to tell us it was <laughs> a rat plague. <laughs> Second Thessalonians 1, seven. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed in heaven with his mighty angels. Luke 9.26. When he shall come in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. That's spectacular. Mm -hmm. Right? The glory of God is so that it outshines the sun numerous times. Yeah. No human eye can behold it and live unless you're specifically prepared for it. Mm. Even mm. Moses, he just reflected a little bit of the glory and, and the Israelites couldn't, couldn't look, look upon him. him. Yeah. Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the angels with him, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory. So he doesn't come as the lowly savior, the sacrificial savior. Mm. He comes as the king of kings and lord of lords. So I think it's pretty clear how will he come spectacularly. Yes. Exactly. 
Revelation 5.11 tells us, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now, the Bible doesn't use the word million or billion or trillion. But if you multiply this out, this is billions and billions of angels. Spectacular. Spectacular, yeah. Another feature about the second coming is it will be audible. Mm. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. So everybody will hear it. Yes. Now Martin, that voice even penetrates the ears of the dead. Yes. Hmm? It brings them out of the grave. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. So Martin, who's going to be gathered? His elect. Not the others, right? No. You have to be very careful when you read the Bible. What does it really say? Yeah. Not do it, what does somebody think it says. And what do you want to hear? He, what do you want it to say? Correct. Mm -hmm. So we're not interested in dynamic equivalence. <laughs> we want to know what did God say, right? And then a very important verse. He will not touch the earth. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Number of points here. Mm -hmm. uh, he sends his angels to gather them and they come together in the clouds. Mm -hmm. So they're going to this vast throng of angels, yeah. right? They'll be taken up with that vast throng of angels. They meet the Lord in the air and from then onwards there's no separation anymore between the redeemed and God, right? Yeah. So this is what will happen when Jesus returns. So if you've read these verses now, what does that do to any secret liaison? There cannot be anything secret about it. No. So that's why Jesus warned, if you're here, mm -hmm. they're in the inner room, don't go. If you hear this, that, and the other, don't go. That's why Jesus warned in Matthew 24, 26, and 27, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, don't go. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, I told that story once when I was giving lectures in Switzerland. And uh, I was in this big hall in Zurich. Mm. And I was lecturing on the New Age movement and the Maitreya. Mm -hmm. I've told this before somewhere. And while I was lecturing, there was quite a large audience. And the people got fed up with me. Because they said, that's a lot of nonsense. There's no such thing as a Maitreya mm. trying to masquerade as Christ. At that stage, Benjamin Cream was busy with all of his, his being overshadowed. And some of them actually got up and they were <laughs> quite vociferous. They said, nah, <laughs> we don't want to listen to this nonsense. And they walked out. And a lot of people walked out of the hall. It's uh, quite disconcerting when that happens, Martin. Yeah. So I said, okay, Lord, <laughs> they obviously don't believe this. Please help a little bit here. Yeah? And I carried on with the lecture, and the rest of the people stayed there. And I said, well, I can't help it if they don't believe it, but this is what is happening. And about 20 minutes later, there was a big hustle, and they all came running back into the hall. Isn't that strange? <laughs> I can think the surprise in your face. Yes. And I said, going what's going on now? <laughs> now, it just so happened, do you believe in chance or do you believe uh, in providence, Martin? Yeah, providence. You believe in providence? It just so happened that in a uh, venue in a big hotel, just opposite where we were having the lectures, 
Benjamin Cream was being overshadowed by the Maitreya at that exact time while I was delivering that exact lecture. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and as these people came out, a throng came out of that hotel, shouting and screaming their heads off, Matreya is here! Matreya is here! And they were handing out things to the people in the street. And people were saying, what's going on? What's going on? And they were excited and said how he'd been overshadowed by the Matreya. And they realized, well, maybe that guy's not talking nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> and they ran back into the hall. So don't listen if you hear he's in a hotel in Zurich. Don't go. No. No. Because that's not the way it's going to come. And we've also shown slides. Don't believe it when a top Sanhedrin rabbi says he's in communication with him. He's already talking yeah. to him. We've shown the, all of those slides. We don't have to do it. All right, so what will take place at the second coming? That's the next logical question, isn't mm -hmm. it? Well, the Bible tells us it's going to be the resurrection of the righteous. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Does that imply that there's another resurrection that of the dead? dead that are not in Christ? Yes. So there's a first resurrection and there's a second. second resurrection. We have to look at that, right? The Bible is self-explanatory. So how long will the others remain dead? That's the next question, mm -hmm. right? Revelation 20 verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. And then it refers to that previous statement. This is the first resurrection when it describes the coming of Christ. The first resurrection is the resurrection of the righteous. Thessalonians makes that quite clear. And the rest of the dead don't wake up for another thousand years. Mm. Now people will say, you know, you're jumping from Thessalonians to, re to Revelation mm. and maybe to a verse in the Old Testament, but that's exactly what the Bible says. Yeah. You have to make a detailed study, put all the verses together, here a little, there a little, until the picture becomes clear. It may not be hazy. That's so true, because then you won't have a problem of misinterpreting. Correct. So let's just make absolutely sure what resurrection, if you should die before the Lord comes, mm. what re resurrection would you want to be part of? The first one. Correct. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. By implication, it's a very sad thing to be part of the second, second resurrection. So the Bible has two resurrections, the resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. That's pretty clear, right? Mm -hmm. All right, at the second coming of the, the righteous living will be translated because there will be living people in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now we just heard that Christ will come with the trump of God, right? Yes. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So this we refers to the living. Yes. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. That's Hebrew parallelism. Mm -hmm. hmm? You're just repeating the same thought in different words. Yes. In other words, you're emphasizing it. You're giving it power. Mm. I love the way they wrote that. Yeah. No, it's like you said, and even with the chiasms, Yes. And it gets lost in the new translations. Yes, it's totally lost. You need the sandwich. You need mm. to see what is being highlighted. Yeah. It's like taking a highlighter, right? <laughs> Except that God took the highlighter. <laughs> That's that beautifully. Like, I've got beautiful. something hidden here for you. I want you to see it. So let's look at a summary in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20, 22, and 23. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. It's interesting that they slept, right? Yes. 
For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. Now, this is a, a interesting verse because there have been resurrections before. Mm -hmm. Moses was resurrected yes. because we read that uh, Michael was in a confrontation yes, with, with the devil mm -hmm. right over his body and he went to heaven. So he, uh, he saw death and he was raised. But he was not the first fruits. He was as it were, a post-data check. Yes. Christ is the first fruit. So he had a resurrection by promise of the resurrection of Christ. Yeah. If Christ didn't rise, Moses couldn't have had to come back. Correct. So Moses was a representative of those that were asleep mm -hmm. that would be raised from the dead. And Elijah was a representative of those that would not see death. Yes. That's why those two they represent the law and the prophets, yeah. came and were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's important to know that Christ is the first fruit. But the Bible does say in Romans that death reigned from Adam to Moses. Well, yes, I remember. Mm -hmm. So it does tell us that's when for the first time somebody was resurrected and given immortality. Yes. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Well, so this is an interesting summary. But for the rest of humanity, well, there are still some others as well. Enoch was an example of the pre-flood world mm -hmm. that uh, God would honor his promise. So he was the guarantee to the pre-flood world, Moses and Elijah to the post-flood world, typifying the resurrection at the end. And then there were a couple that were raised at the resurrection of Christ. Yes, and those were, went up with his ascension into heaven. Correct, because he says when he went up, he took captives in his train. Yes, and they were forming part of this first fruits. Yes, that and he had to what their mission is in heaven, the Bible doesn't tell us, so let's not speculate about it. So this brings us to a very important point, namely the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, which is a very intricate portion mm. of the whole sequence of events. It will also play a very big part in misleading in the end time. Correct. Genesis 2 verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That was God's proclamation. 3 verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. We've dealt with this in many cases, mm -hmm. but this is what humanity basically believes. Immortality. Yeah. An altered state, but immortal. So even if you're dead, yes. but you're alive, you're immortal. Yes, so they like to say the soul mm -hmm. will go to heaven. But unfortunately for them, Ezekiel 18 verse 20 says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Because the soul refers to the entire entity. Mm, the soul is the breath plus the, the material, the earth, come together and man became a living soul. Yes. That whole entity will die. So there is no ghostly afterlife. Mm. 1 Timothy 1.17 Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In other words, the only one who is immortal is God. Yes. And only God can give immortality. 1 Timothy 6.14 that thou keep his commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the commission. So do and so hear as those that live according to the law, right? Yeah. Verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who 
only has immortality. That makes it quite clear. Mm -hmm. So the doctrine of immortality is not biblical. No. It's a Roman Catholic doctrine, and it's a pagan doctrine. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And 1 Timothy 6.16 Six, in the New King James Version says, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Now let's just qualify this. Nobody can see him if he is sinful mm -hmm. and live. Mm -hmm. Will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So obviously if you want to live in the presence of God, you have to have a immortal body. So Moses had to be resurrected in an immortal body, mm. one that could stand in the presence of God. Previously, when Mo Moses was with God, God had to veil his glory in a cloud. When he asked to see his glory, God said, you cannot see me and live. But I will hide you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand. And when I go by, you can see me from the back. And not even from the front. No. So this is amazing. So no man can live in a sinful human state and be in the presence of God. So what does this tell us? What will happen to those unrepentant ones at the end of time? They will be destroyed. They will be destroyed. And not of God's doing. By clinging to their yeah. sin. By clinging to sin, you will be destroyed with your sin. That's why the Bible says the man of sin will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So let's just make sure, we've had this many times, but uh, for clarity's sake, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that man is immortal. The Church teaches that every spiritual soul is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death. That is Greek philosophy. It's not a biblical uh, story. Do they know it? Yes, the New Catholic Encyclopedia tells us that the soul in the Old Testament means not a part of man. In other words, he cannot separate. They know it. They know it. But the whole man is a living being. They are so arrogant that in the face of this knowledge, they still claim to believe the serpent rather than God. Yeah. So even in the New Testament, it signifies human life, the life of an individual conscious object. So the Bible doesn't teach it, they say. They teach it. And then it talks, if you want to analyze it, so if you want to do an exegesis on it, it says that the New Testament does not teach the immortality of the soul in the Hellenistic sense of survival of an immortal principle after death. They know it, Martin. Unbelievable, huh? It's, it's a tragedy. If you know you're teaching something that's not biblical. You're actually teaching the serpent's language. It's a lie. So let's have a quick brief look at this issue of death, the mystic realm of death, Genesis 2 verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He didn't receive one. Mm. He is the living entity. That's why when the, the breath leaves, when your metabolism stops, mm -hmm. You go back to dust. Yeah. So dust plus breath is a living soul. That's the definition in the Bible. Mm. Daniel 12 verse 13. But go thy way till the end be. Thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So what is he going to do? He's going to sleep. And then he's going to rise. The New King James puts it this way, But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. So it just makes it 
little clearer that you do not go to heaven when you die. You rest and you receive immortality at the end. If we look at John chapter 11 from verse 11, these things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, because they thought he was literally sleeping. Yes, when he said this. Yes, because Jesus says he sleeps, and I go that I may wake him up. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he's asleep, he shall do well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So when Christ talks about his people, when they die, he talks to them as sleeping. Yeah, They're not really dead, they're sleeping. In him they are alive, yeah. but they're not physically there. Job makes it quite clear in chapter 14 verse 10, But man dieth. And he wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, the ruach, the breath. Mm -hmm. And where is he? So this chava, die, give up the ghost, means to die, to perish, to expire, to be about to die. Now how long will they be gone? Till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Job 14, verse 12. Now the Bible says when Christ returns, the heavens will roll up like a scroll. Yes. So when is this? This is with his second coming. A little bit here and a little bit there. It's, it's very clear in Job. It's very clear, yes. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 19. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth the beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man has no preeminence above a beast. Like an animal dies, so man dies. An animal has metabolism, and when that metabolism stops, the animal is dead. Yeah. Same thing happens to a human being. So it's pretty clear. Now, the Roman Catholic Church is adamant that it prefers the serpent's version. Obviously because they call called the man of sin. Yeah. And they want to cling to sin, which is transgression of the law, and they want their cake and eat it. They want immortality. So just redefine what God said, right? Yeah. So Pope Leo, on Monday, December 19, 15, 13, issued a bull declaring, we do condemn and reprobate all who assert that the intelligent soul is mortal. And the reason why I did that is because the reformers, Martin Luther mm -hmm. amongst them, believed that when you die, you sleep. Yeah. So the bull was directed against this growing, what they called heresy, of those who denied the natural immortality of the soul and avowed the conditional immortality of man. So man is immortal on condition of obedience. Yeah. So they were totally against it, and you were a heretic if you believed this. Correct. And Martin Luther, he made the following statement. We should learn to view our death in the right light, so that we need not become alarmed on account of it, as unbelief does, because in Christ it is indeed not death, but a fine, sweet, and brief sleep which brings us release from this veil of tears, from sin and from fear and extremity of the real death, and from all the misfortunes of this life. And we shall be secure and without care, rest sweetly and gently for a brief moment as on a sofa, until the time when he shall waken us together with all his dear children to the eternal glory and joy. So what Martin Luther believed, is it in harmony with the Bible? Yes. And it sounds actually quite sweet. Yes. It's, it's something not to be uh, discouraged with. So Martin, what about all these stories about mm. appearances of ghosts and people talking to you? That's where the deception comes in. Correct. And that's a very, very scary thing. Now if the dead know nothing, mm -hmm. then who's talking to you when that happens? 
it must be something spiritual. And uh, is it an entity from God? No. Did God forbid communication with the so-called dead? Yes. Why? Because he knew that it would take them down a, a path of um, perdition. sin and perdition. Correct. So when you're speaking to an entity, you're actually speaking to a demon. I don't know. You you look like a good chap. I don't think you ever dabbled in spiritism like I did, right? No. You didn't uh, use Ouija boards and things like that. No, but I hear it's very popular still for a Christmas gift. Yes. So it's there's lots of uh, people that still that communicate with the it. dead. They're talking mm. to demons. Mm. Now, when my mother was dead, I tried to contact my mother. And I actually spoke to demon entities. Mm. And uh, we used the Ouija board as well. And my wife and I were doing it once and talking to these entities. We were atheists. But we were talking to enti entities. Isn't mm. that interesting? Yeah, It's such an oxymoron <laughs> contradiction in terms. <laughs> and she and I, we had our finger on that glass and it was spelling out. And I asked about my mother. And it spelled out all kinds of silly things. And uh, I was adamant. I wanted to speak to her. And then suddenly that glass went berserk. And it sped across that thing. There was no way you could hold it up. Mm. Now, when that happened, the hairs on the back of your neck, they just started rising. And that glass went crazy. And it spelled out, go to hell. Yeah. And when it had finished spelling, go to hell, the glass flew off the table from under our fingers <laughs> across the room. Now, Martin, that's when you know you're not dealing with normal things. You're dealing with the supernatural. So you're speaking to demon entities. And when uh, King Saul spoke to the mm -hmm. witch of Ender, there was a veil in between. So he didn't speak directly to this entity, but that entity was a demon masquerading as yes. Samuel. Yes. So Martin Luther continues and he says, for since we call it a sleep, we know that we shall not remain in it, but be again awakened and live. And that the time during which we sleep shall seem no longer than if we had just fallen asleep. Hence we shall censure ourselves that we were surprised or alarmed at such a sleep in the hour of death and suddenly come alive out of the grave and from decomposition and entirely well fresh with pure, clear, glorified life meet the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the clouds. Martin, did he understand it? Yes, he understood what the Bible is actually teaching on it. Scripture everywhere affords such consolation which speaks of the death of the saints as if they fell asleep and were gathered to their fathers. That ease had overcome death through his faith and comfort in Christ and awaited the resurrection together with the saints who preceded them in death. This is an absolute biblical exposition of what the Bible says. Yes, and Satan will definitely use the opposite to deceive. Now, how important is it that you know this? I think it will be a life and death situation. So here at the end of time, when loved ones suddenly start appearing mm -hmm. to people, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I listen to seances in my, my terrible days where s entities would speak and they would be in such high positions in heaven mm. that they would even supersede the position of Christ. And I'm talking about seances with Cecil John Rhodes appearing and even statements that Adolf Hitler was in a better position than Christ in the hierarchy. Such blasphemy. And then there will be false Christs appearing. Mm. If you know these things, you will not be confused. You know that Christ will come and he'll stay in the air and that no entity can talk to you. Little Light Studios did a great interview with someone that was 
um, taking part in these things. So I'll put that link in. Excellent. But then there's also an interesting thing, and I remember you mentioned it quite a while back when we were doing the one on UFOs. That's also linking on with this. Yes, absolutely. So, and even Little Eye Studios did a, a very good documentary on that. So I'll put that link also in. But this will all f form part of this end time scenario. Uh, we must deception. watch out for these deceptions at the end of time. This issue with beings appearing in space vehicles uh, and the manifestations that take place when they appear are very much the same as you find in some Pentecostal churches. Exactly. They start speaking in tongues, mm -hmm. they start falling over, all of these issues. And it is, it is a state of hypnosis. Mm. And these are spirit entities impersonating other beings. So if you know these things, you will not be deceived. Now Martin, Martin Luther wasn't the only one who understood it. The other translator of the Bible, William Tyndall, mm. he understood it as well. He wrote, uh, here's an article, Came, he came to the defense of the revived teaching of the conditional immortality. So early on, when the Reformation started, God impressed this truth upon the Reformers. And it is unthinkable mm -hmm. that the very next number of them would reject it again and go back to the old. It's not in their catechism. Well, that just shows you how strong of a delusion this is. Correct. So they rev this teaching was revived that uh, immortality is conditional. This is, as well as other teachings, brought him di in direct conflict with the papal champion Thomas More, who strongly objected against Tyndall and Luther, who, in the words of More, said, All souls lie and sleep till doomsday. In 1530, Tyndale responded vigorously. So Moore was being sarcastic and say, you people say the souls sleep till doomsday. No, they don't. They go to heaven. They're immortal, mm, right? That's or they go to hell or they go to purgatory or whatever. And uh, Tyndall quite sarcastically answered, and ye, talking to Thomas Moore, in putting them, the departed souls, in heaven, hell, and purgatory, destroy the arguments wherewith Christ and Paul prove the resurrection. And again, if the souls be in heaven, tell me why they be not in as good case as the angels be. And then what cause is there of the resurrection? It's a good question. Exactly. If they're all happy and like the angels, why do they need to be resurrected? Waste of time, right? Yep. So he pressed his contention even further, showing that the papal teaching on the subject is in conflict with St. Paul. Nay, Paul, now he's being sarcastic, thou art unlearned. Go to Master Moore and learn a new way. We be not most miserable, though we rise not again, for our souls go to heaven as soon as we be dead and are there in great joy as Christ that is risen again. And I marvel that Paul had not comforted the Thessalonians with that doctrine, if he had wished it, if he'd known about it that the souls of their dead should rise again? If the souls be in heaven, in as great glory as the angels of the your doctrine, then show me what cause should there be of the resurrection. So they understood it, Martin. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go to the Catholic religion, then you'll see that the Council of Trent decided in purgatory the souls can themselves wipe out their debt only by suffering. So there's no salvation by faith. No imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ. You have to be saved by your works, no. even in death. So Martin, when you look at this little car and it says, rust in peace, then that's really what it's doing. It's rusting in peace. But it won't have a resurrection. No. But those that rest in peace, they mm -hmm. will. Yeah. So when that resurrection takes place, Martin, that'll be a very joyous day. But uh, you will have to be judged before that, right? Yes. 
So when Christ comes and he raises you from the dead, then he must have judged you already. That is the investigative judgment. Correct. Must take place in heaven. It's biblical. Yes. A lot of people say, no, it's not biblical. because it. But it, if he brings his reward and the verdict with, then obviously it already had to take place. It is so logical that people don't see it. It's unbelievable. And he will render to each one according to his deeds, right? That means there must have been a judgment. Romans 2 verse 7, And to them who by patience, continuance in doing well, seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. There's something that you must do to attain it. Behold, I show you a mystery, 1 Corinthians 15. That's a very interesting sequence in 1 Corinthians 15, from verse 51. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, there will be a resurrection, and the living will be changed at the same time. Yes. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So Martin, if you only get immortality at the resurrection, then nobody other than those few that have been uh, typologically exalted in that way uh, will actually receive it, right? For this corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It is crystal clear. It is so clear. And nobody in the churches out there preaches it. Yes, they take the last verse, verse 55, and read that and then put the person in heaven. Whereas they just read the previous verses and leave them out. It can't happen because it's only at this resurrection when this happens. Correct. So again, let's make sure, Second Timothy 4, 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. So at that day, is that his death, or is that the second coming? Second coming. It qualifies it. It is crystal clear in the Scripture. And you know, it's such a relief. When my father died, I had a very strange experience. Mm -hmm. I was alone at his hospital bed the night that he died. And uh, his breath just became shallower and shallower and shallower. And then eventually he died. He stopped breathing. And Martin, when he stopped breathing, he suddenly sat up in bed with his arms stretched out as if he was greeting someone. Mm. And I had a very strange feeling. Well, I drove home from that hospital that night and I was aware that there was an entity with me in the car. Mm. It was a very strange occurrence. Remember, I was steeped in spiritualism. Yeah. And I got home, and I went and sat in a chair in the lounge, and the doors were closed, and suddenly the curtain opened. Now, that's very freaky when that happens. But in my, in my ignorance, I basically said goodbye to this entity, being convinced in myself that it was the spirit of my father, mm -hmm. right? Now, who produced those manifestations for my education? Satan. And is he doing that throughout the world? Yes. And is he using movies to propagate it oh. all the time? This is his trump God. Yes. God. Mm -hmm. And that is why we need to be rooted in the scriptures. 
to understand what this is all about. That is so important because, like you said, this is the trump card. This is the one he's going to use because this affects your your emotions completely when it comes to deceased. And, and you have this longing to be in communication mm. with them, right? That's why I wanted to speak to my mother. I mean, she died when I was 12. Mm. And when I discovered what the scripture says, do you know what a relief that was? Actually, that when I realized the situation of the dead, it was, <sighs> thank heaven that it's like that. Because you, you constantly have this notion that she's up there in heaven chewing her fingernails, watching <laughs> what you do that's, that's silly and stupid and ridiculous and dangerous and uh, seeing every sin that you are committing. I mean, it must be a nightmare to watch it all, right? Mm -hmm. Or to see your children struggling and going through hard times and nobody to take care of them. Some of them end up in foster homes and are unhappy. And some are happy, whatever. And all of that just disappears. They know nothing. They are asleep. Yeah. God knows. But God is also the only one who can redeem you mm -hmm. from all the mistakes and all of those issues. So you want to confess your sins to God and you want to make right with God and then you want to trust in Him. But thank God that your loved ones are unaware of all the pitfalls that you go through mm -hmm. and the mistakes that you make. Matthew 24 verse 30 tells us what will happen to the wicked. Because remember, there will be dead ones, mm -hmm. they will not rise for a thousand years, and there will be living ones. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So here's a great multitude that is not very happy. Mm -hmm. They're mourning. So what happens to them? Revelation six fifteen to 17. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains. I think people should watch the news to know who we're talking about. Exactly. Right? All these leaders, all everything. Who's part of this? Who's part of this? And who are these great men? And who are these rich men? And who are these chief captains and mighty men? And bondsmen and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand martin they still have time for reflection yes i think some of the kings of the world might still change sides. Mm, Nebuchadnezzar mm. did. Yeah. But they will be few and far between. Maybe some of the rich men will change sides and put their energies on God's sides rather than what they're doing at the moment. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, that's the angels, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly amongst them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Not in this verse, Jude 14 and 15. How many people and how many uh, programs use the Lord's name in vain and mock him to his face? I think it's almost a miracle if you find one that does not blaspheme the name or use the name in vain. Now, most of the actors in this world belong to secret fraternities, right? Mm. And those secret fraternities, especially when you get to the higher levels, are Luciferians. Mm -hmm. And they hate Christ. Yeah. Therefore, it is second nature for them to use the Lord's name in vain. Yeah. And uh, they use it as an explicit in virtually every movie. That's it. Therefore, it's impossible for me to look at some of these things. That's true. Because it's horrendous the way they act. If they were to do the same with even the prophets of some of the other religions, they could end up 
being lynched. <laughs> Zephaniah 1, 14 and 15, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So there are two groups. Mm, yes, yeah. Those that say, this is our God, we have waited for him and he will save us. It's the best day ever. It's and wonderful, full of glory. And this is the worst day ever, right? For the other. For the other group. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall cons consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, that's a very interesting verse. So you cannot stand in the presence of God in that brightness if you are the man yeah. of sin, if you are sinful. And you know what? We've got these two explanations of the difference of how it's going to be for the different um, groups. But the sad part is that both of them, it's their own choice. It's their choice. If you cling to sin, you'll be destroyed together so, with it. Yeah, so maybe it's not the sad part. It's sad and good part. Yes. Is it's your own choice. Correct. Now, what comes out of the mouth of, of the Lord? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Correct. So they will be judged by the word yeah. and by the law of God. That's it. There is the standard. And Jeremiah makes it very clear, 25 verse 33, And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Mm -hmm. So where do they come across this idea of a temporal millennium where everybody is converted? Yeah, you're on earth. Doesn't happen. It's not biblical. So in other words... They cannot be lamented and they cannot be gathered and they cannot be buried because the living righteous are gone mm. and everybody else is dead. Dead. So they shall be dung upon the ground. That's the reality. Zephaniah tells us how complete this destruction will be. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off man from off the land, says the Lord. So what happens to the animal kingdom? Also. There'll be nothing left. Nothing. There's nothing on earth alive. So this, this earth goes back to its primordial state, the abusos, yeah. the, the abyss, where the Spirit of God went over. Correct. Now to make quite sure, Psalms 110 verse 5 and 6. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge amongst the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies and he shall wound the head over many countries. What does that tell you about the leaders of the world in the last days? They will be destroyed with the man of sin. Martin, I've been looking at all the events, at the terrible tyranny that is taking place of all over the world, mm. how the kings of the world are lording it over their subjects, herding them into camps, yeah. maltreating them. I've been looking at some of the statistics at how people are affected by the procedures that are being used today. How many people are dying? How many children are born uh, misformed or deformed? How many children are stillborn, babies stillborn? Mm. The suffering in the world is unbelievable. And like you said, a lot of it's been implemented by these great men. Yes. So... I wonder whether they know what is coming. Mm. Are they doing it because they are deceived? Are they doing it because they are convinced? I think they should become convicted and should look at what the world is going through 
and ask themselves the question, are we dealing aright with the Lord's heritage? Those that he died for. Jeremiah chapter 4 from verse 23 onwards, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. So this was because they rolled up like a scroll, right? Mm. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and there, there was no man. And all the birds of heaven were fled, so there were no birds. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, for thus has the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and I will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. So this is what happens at the second coming of Christ. Mm. Everything is destroyed, but it's not the end yet. No. There's something that will take place in heaven, and then there will be a third coming of Christ for a final culmination of all of these things. But the Bible is clear, there will be desolate cities and the wicked living are slain at the second coming. In other words, there can be no secret rapture. No. It's not possible. Not especially if you read this Jeremiah verse now. So everything they say about the secret rapture comes out of a Jesuit teaching. Dispensationalism. And we've had the progression of this teaching coming out of the Jesuit stable and out of Rome. And it has infiltrated the world. Mm. And the evangelicals are not teaching a biblical doctrine, but a Jesuitical doctrine. We read in 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. What a beautiful verse. A day of retribution is coming. And if you want to have retribution, then choose that. But if you want to have rest with God's people, well, then that's a different choice. Revelation 20 verse 1 and 2 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the keys of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So Martin, for a thousand years, the devil is bound down here. Mm -hmm. And he is bound in the sense that there's nobody left to confuse or lead astray. Yes, everything is dead. He's sitting on a broken planet. And he can just think of him about yeah. everything. So Satan is bound in change of circumstance for a thousand years. Psalm 68 verse 6 says, God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Now, are these spiritual chains? Chains of circumstance, or are they literal? This is circumstance. Exactly. So in the same way, the devil mm. is bound by chains of circumstance. So this is what happens in the millennium. Mille annus means 1,000 years. For 1,000 years, the dead shall not be raised, the wicked dead. Yeah. They will not rise for 1,000 years, says the Bible. All the animals, all the cities, everything is destroyed. The righteous have met the Lord in the air and have been taken away. And the dead that were not in Christ are dead. Mm -hmm. And only the devil and his angels is bound here by chains of circumstance. Yeah. So Martin, this is basically the summary, right? Yes. Now, when the Bible speaks about the Battle of Armageddon. Mm. What was that battle? When the Bible speaks about the Battle of Gog and Magog, yeah. what was that battle? 
How do we fit all of these into Scripture? So basically, in a nutshell, the battle of Armageddon is what takes place when Christ returns. He wars against those kings and against all the impenitent, and they are destroyed by the brightness of his coming mm -hmm. and by the culmination of the seventh plague. But I think we should deal with that in a little bit more detail and just flesh it out. What are these battles that take place? And uh, describe Armageddon, and describe what happens in the millennium, and describes what happens at the Battle of Gog and Magog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we can sum it all up and have a correct sequence or a biblical sequence as to what the chain of events is. Yes, that's So perhaps we should uh, make a part two mm. and continue this discussion in another one. Yes, that would be great. Okay, so shall we pray? Heavenly Father, the second coming will be a very glorious event, but it will also be a very tragic event for probably the great majority of humanity. And it is therefore of utmost importance that we understand the sequence of events and that we also understand what our part is, namely to confess our sins, forsake our sins, and claim the righteousness of Christ. Because justification by faith is the great passport that we require. And sanctification is our fitness for heaven. Bless us in our decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.